Welcome to, welcome to the Iowa Environmental Council's 2022 Legislative Preview. We're excited to share with you a little bit about what we are anticipating for this session, help you uh, feel more uh, able to make an impact through your advocacy and partnering with us on the issues that we care about that impact all of us as Iowans. So as most of you know, we have a great team of staff here. You're gonna hear from several of us this, um, this webinar to talk about the work that we're doing at the Capitol. We've been growing over the past year and have you know, people located in different parts of the state focused on clean water, clean energy, environmental justice, climate change, so we're really excited for all of you for helping support us and grow our team to be even more impactful together with you. We also have a great board of directors and I especially um, wanna thank the members of our policy committee. We'll talk a little bit more this morning about what they do to help us um, set our agenda for the legislative session and help support that advocacy strategy. So first I wanna give some of our staff a chance to talk about last year and um, some of the successes and reflections that we have on the 2021 session. Ingrid, do you wanna start? Yeah, I'll go ahead and start. And um, uh, Ange oh no, Angelisa or whoever is running the Zoom, uh, I think you need to allow me to turn my video on. Um, First, uh, in our efforts last session, actually, Harry, do you want to go first? I'm going to sequester my dog. Sorry, everyone. Yes, absolutely. Um, and we can work out these uh, technical details as we're getting dogs under, under control. So um, 2021 legislative efforts, um, it was definitely an unusual year um, with the pandemic as we continue in that um, in that uh, similar realm. Um, on the energy side, one of our largest efforts was to work against uh, House File 555, which offered protections to the natural gas industry by um, preventing local governments from um, stopping uh, new natural gas hookups or really regulating natural gas hookups in any way. Um, unfortunately, that bill did pass and was signed into law by the governor, so we're still um, looking at what ways that's going to impact local government operations going forward. We also um, spent a lot of effort working to extend the solar tax credit. Um, uh, many uh, Iowans had applied for and um, had the impression that they would receive the tax credit. It was It has been a hugely successful credit to spur solar development in the state. And unfortunately, it did expire at the end of 2021 um, with about four and a half million dollars of tax credits that were not paid out to folks who had applied for the credit. Um, and so uh, some of our partners I know will be working on efforts to try to make whole the people who did not receive the credit that were, was promised to them. And so um, we will definitely be in support of those efforts. Throw it back over to Ingrid if she's ready. Uh, I'm here. Thanks, Carrie. Um, on the water and land side, we um, REAP is one of our um, uh, primary uh, concerns every year. It's one of the most successful conservation programs in the state. Uh, REAP stands for Resource Enhancement and Protection program uh, last year we uh, and every year we advocate for full funding of REAP at $20 million. Um, last year we got a status quo funding um, at $12 million. So um, based on everything that happened in the session last year, uh, we, we consider that a win to at least maintain uh, REAP at its level of funding. Uh, in 2020, we also extended the REAP sunset. Um, uh, so uh, that is something we'll continue to work on um, uh, this legislative session. We also, um, uh, Senate File 587 was a bill that would have uh, eliminated the conservation tax credit. Uh, we worked with other groups 
such as INHF um, to uh, keep that bill from passing. That would have made it difficult for people or less attractive for people to donate private land for, for public use uh, by eliminating that tax credit. And luckily that um, bill did not end up passing last session. And I will hand it back over to Brian. Thanks. So looking forward into 2022, a couple of key dates to put on your calendars to pay attention to as we think about the session. So the legislature gavels in on Monday the 10th and the day after the governor will give her state of the state address and we'll talk about you know, some of her priorities. Um, the first funnel is February 18th. And just as a reminder, this is the second year of a two year biennium. And so you know, we'll be seeing some legislation that was introduced previously along with you know, new legislation that will be introduced during this session. So this is all a lot to keep track of. And we just wanna emphasize that we have some tools to help you with that. So the place to go is our legislative portal. Um, you can see the URL down there at the bottom of the screen. Um, this has some of these key dates, um, so you don't have to write them all down right now. There's links to the legislature's website where you can find, you know, um, the full text of legislation, lists of legislators, contact information, some of that. We also have current and past issues of our legislative news bulletin, which is our weekly email that you'll be getting throughout the legislative session. We have our bill tracker where you can get information about the um, legislation that we are monitoring, that we have registered for or against, that we're working on with some of our partners. And as always, we'll be sending out additional action alerts when we think it's important for citizens to speak up and reach out to their elected officials. So be sure to pay attention to that legislative portal along with the other communications that we'll be sharing. So a little bit about how we do our advocacy work. We just thought it would be nice to, you know, just remind everybody, share a little bit more about some of the things that we think are important and effective in this work and ways that you can be a part of it. So as an organization, we think it's really important to listen to you, listen to other partners, and to learn together about, you know, what are the important issues affecting all of us. So each um, biennium, we set forth a whole slate of, of broad policy objectives, things that we wanna advocate for or against. And then each year, together with our policy committee of our board of directors, we set forth you know, specific legislative priorities. All those things are um, posted through our legislative portal. You can, um, you can read those in detail, but those really shape you know, where we put our attention um, helps us to, you know, focus on what are the things we should be monitoring and what are the specific strategies that we want to pursue to support good environmental policy in Iowa. We also, you know, do all of this through lots and lots of collaboration. So we have meetings like this one, we have small, you know, one-on-one -on -one conversations with legislators and citizens, and lots of work with um, member organizations. So as you may know, the Iowa Environmental Council has over 100 member organizations around the state, and we work really closely, especially through the legislative session with our um, roundtable gatherings and trying to coordinate our efforts, as you see there, especially on things like solar and energy efficiency, on funding the trust for um, outdoor recreation and conservation, and working together to help educate legislators. So the picture you see there is a tour that we did this summer with a group of Republican and Democratic um, state legislators, along with some staff from Cindy Axney's office. We learned all about um, some different farm practices for, you know, conserving soil health and clean water, as well as um, distributed solar and some energy related um, practices. So we do lots of things during the session to collaborate as well as um, in the summer and in between. 
We also you know, maintain a very regular presence at the Capitol. So um, we try to be your eyes and ears there, attending committee meetings, meeting with legislators, um, and really thinking about the strategy and the tactics for how we can um, help them develop good policy and support the right kind of legislation through the process. So again, we try to do that and to, to share a lot of that information with our members around the state. So there's, again, few ways you can follow that. The weekly legislative news bulletin that comes as an email, look for action alerts. We'll also um, share a little more at the end of the webinar today about our advocacy day and some trainings that we'll be doing coming up in the next several weeks to help you um, make sure that you're prepared to, to do things like write letters and messages, make phone calls, and visit with your elected officials. As we do all of our work, you know, two of the things that we really prioritize are climate change and environmental justice. And so we're gonna hear in just a minute about some specific legislation focused on clean energy and clean water, but we really see all of this as, as tied together through this lens of climate change and environmental justice. That's really our core focus. So as part of our policy priorities that we adopted two years ago, we really put an emphasis on um, partnering with Black, Indigenous, and people of color and the organizations and communities that they're part of. Um, we have tried to have you know, conversations with lots of different groups to anticipate what some of the um, possible policies might be that are coming during this session and how we can work together with them. Um, we also are really placing an emphasis on you know, climate change, how we can mitigate um, the ongoing causes of climate change and also how we can work as a state to adapt and to respond to the impacts of climate change that we're already already seeing. So with, with that sort of behind the scenes look at how we do our work, we're going to turn now to the specific things that we're looking for for this 2022 session. So Carrie Johansson will, will talk again about our energy and climate priorities. Carrie? Thanks, Brian. So on the energy and climate front, um, we have a number of things that have, you know, energy almost every year, um, along with water, many of the issues that IEC works on seem to be a topic of debate up at the Capitol. Um, we are really going to continue to make it a priority to keep Iowa a leader when it comes to clean energy, protecting our good distributed energy policies that allow people to have their own solar and wind battery storage um, increasingly as well in the state. We want to see Iowa maintain our wind energy leadership and grow utility scale solar as well. So uh, the last few years we've seen some bills introduced that have been uh, would have been detrimental to siting of large scale renewables. Right now siting is mainly uh, done at the local level, we would definitely um, not want to see uh, anything passed that would hamstring um, the ability of local governments to have wind and solar sited in their area, um, or that would be more restrictive than is really reasonable for um, for safety um, and to balance interests in the local local areas. Um, we want to see protection for existing state and local policies and programs that are encouraging energy efficiency. We know that at the state level, our energy efficiency programs um, have really shrunk over the last several years. Um, and so we want to see local governments continue to be able to encourage people to save energy um, and save money where it makes sense. And then we definitely want to continue to support policies that increase equitable access to clean energy. And the flip side of that, of course, is to um, oppose any policies that would um, exacerbate existing inequalities um, in the energy world. Um, our next set of priorities are around electrification. Um, we, in Iowa, several years ago, we had um, a tax and fee law passed on electric vehicles that was um, not really uh, equitable and fair. 
uh, we would like to see legislators start to um, understand how <clears throat> that will affect EV adoption, um, but we'd also support any um, additional development of charging infrastructure. Um, funding for that might be more prevalent at the federal level at this point, but we want to see that spent in Iowa so that people who do drive electric cars can have the opportunity to charge. Um, and we would support any policies that would incentivize electric vehicles or moving consumers to the use of clean electricity for home heating and cooking as well. And then finally, we're really focused right now on transitioning Iowa entirely away from fossil fuels in the electric sector by 2035. Um, to entirely clean electricity. We are already a national leader on this front. There's no reason Iowa shouldn't be the first state to reach 100% clean energy. Um, and already, uh, and, and we wanna see that done in a way that um, provides support for the communities that have hosted these coal plants for many years and for the workers who um, are employed there. We know that coal is already on the decline in Iowa. One in seven coal jobs were lost in the past five years. and providing planning and support for the communities and the workers is really critical. And so part of that is that we need to know uh, what the timeline is for closing down these coal plants. Um, and we, we do believe and we know that they need to be shut down, um, but we want to know what the timeline can be to allow for planning. And then we would love to see adoption of tools that would ease the financial burden of closing the coal plants, both for ratepayers and for uh, the communities where they're located. Thanks, Carrie. I'm gonna turn it over now to Ingrid Gronstall, who oversees our work on land and water issues. Thanks, Brian, and thanks, Carrie, um, and thanks, uh, Angelisa et al. for getting my camera to work. Um, you'd think at this point on on Zoom we'd ha we'd have this covered, but I, I feel like it's it's always a little bit of a challenge. Um, on the water and land side, um, we have uh, a framework that we used to develop our legislative priorities this year. These are based on the three main buckets of our policy priorities. So, firstly. Um, you, you know, the large majority of land use in the state is intensive row crop agriculture. So um, that's the biggest uh, producer of pollutants in our waterways. So as far as water quality is concerned, agri agricultural pollution is um, our main area of focus, um, uh, mainly nutrient pollution, that's nitrogen and phosphorus, as well as bacteria pollution, you know, sediment, other, other kinds of water quality issues that come from um, agricultural non-point source pollution. Uh, we also are, are advocating for investment in uh, different types of land use across the state um, that can not only improve our land, you know, soil health, water quality, um, but also um, uh, provide economic development opportunities, particularly in rural areas and be um, more inclusive to a, a wide array of groups across the state. So we're looking for ways to um, promote investment in um, a more resilient and diverse uh, landscape across the state. Uh, and then finally, um, as Brian mentioned, you know, environmental justice and climate change are overarching um, uh, priorities for us, uh, but water quantity in the state uh, has become a, a particular issue. The last couple of years we had a, we were in a drought situation. Um, also, there has been a catastrophic, catastrophic flood in basically every um, major area of the state in recent memory. So looking at uh, water quantity and how to address those, uh, particularly with natural infrastructure solutions, um, is, is also a priority of ours. Uh, and with that, we've um, uh, zeroed in on a few specific uh, legislative areas to work on. Um, building off of what I just said, we, we worked last session a little bit. Um, there was a bill that added flood mitigation to county um, level powers and responsibilities, and we, we offered an amendment to that bill. Um, that would specifically call out natural infrastructure as um, tools to mitigate flooding. 
uh, that amendment didn't end up going with that bill last year, um, but we are reintroducing that language this year um, or hoping to reintroduce that language this year uh, and at least get natural infrastructure enumerated in the Iowa code as a, a way to mitigate flooding. Uh, we're also looking at um, a pilot program. Uh, this is something we have um, uh, some legislators interested in. Uh, and if you follow our Iowa Water Watch during the summer, um, there are several lakes that have chronic um, bacteria advisories. Uh, and there's always a question of where is this bacteria coming from? You know, is it waterfowl? Is it um, hog manure? Is it um, leaky? systems and there, uh, it, there are ways to source track and do genetic testing to determine what, um, uh, what source that bacteria is. And so we're looking at potentially getting DNR more resources to um, do source tracking at a few of these um, uh, lakes that have um, chronic problems with bacteria. Uh, and then obviously, um, I will, uh, the Natural Resources and Outdoor Recreation Trust Fund um, is a, a perennial priority of ours. Um, this is something that we are um, keeping a close eye on. Uh, there has been a lot of discussion leading up to session about potential changes in um, the tax code, uh, whether that's um, reducing income tax or, or maybe shifting some taxes around. Um, there might be, uh, if, if some taxes are cut, like income tax, that might um, be an opportunity for the sales tax to be raised. And per the constitutional amendment, um, the first three eighths of a uh, sense of any uh, state sales tax increase will go to I will. Um, but we want to keep an eye on this and make sure, you know, this isn't a lot of um, supplanting funding as opposed to supplemental or that it's not um, uh, particularly uh, regressive. Uh, and then this, uh, we're also, we have partner organizations that are working on soil health um, and getting soil health language into the Iowa code. Um, so here we're supporting um, organizations like ELP, uh, Environmental Law and Policy Center, ELPC, uh, Isaac Walton League, et cetera. Uh, so I'll go through a little bit how to get involved. Brian, do you, I, I think I'm, I'm on these slides. Yep. Okay, perfect. All right, so getting involved, I think mainly part of the reason most of you are on um, this webinar, try to, to, to learn what's happening and then what you can do um, to get involved. I would just say, um, you know, I think it can be, it can feel frustrating uh, or even futile to try to participate in a government process, especially after the last few years. But I will say, at least from my experience, both in this role and previous roles in advocacy, um, that public pressure, public support, and public involvement are the most impactful um, things to, to legislators and, and other decision makers. So um, just a few examples from all the way from historical, you know, uh, landmark um, statutes in the 1970s to more recently in 2020, we extended the REAP sunset um, these are all uh, efforts that were made possible by uh, widespread uh, public support. So uh, we, when we do advocacy trainings, uh, this is a small piece of what we, we talk about when we do advocacy trainings. Um, so we're not only trying to teach people about the substance of issues we're working on, but also the process of getting involved in the process of advocacy. Um, but if people aren't ready to, to make a huge investment in um, advocacy, there are, there are different levels that you can get involved in. So low investment um, uh, based on your, you know, your capacity, your resources, your time, uh, simply, you know, making a phone call, sending an email, uh, that sort of thing uh, is really impactful and doesn't take too long, especially if you respond to something like our, um, our action alerts. We usually have a template in there. We tell you who you need to contact and, and by when and about what, what issues uh, that you may find important. Um, one thing I will say with that is it's, it's always helpful to personalize that some. We, we can give the template, but always, you know, uh, representatives are looking to hear more about um, the constituent story and, and how uh, issues affect you personally and what your specific concerns are. Uh, medium investment, uh, you know, attending a, a town hall, 
uh, going to a public hearing, asking questions, taking notes. Um, this can this can help uh, make sure candidates and and representatives know that these are are issues that their candidates are or that their constituents are concerned about. Uh, you can also you know bring those notes back to us or other advocacy groups and let them know what you're hearing on the ground. That helps us craft a message um, to legislators as well in our day-to-day -day work. Uh, and also writing op-eds or letters to the editor uh, is a great way to um, get your point of view across and, and maybe also rally some support in your local community. Uh, and then high investment, um, you know, uh, arranging a meeting or an event. Uh, we also host an advocacy day every Every year, um, this year is gonna be um, a hybrid of virtual and in-person um, opportunities, but that's that's another opportunity that we, we try to facilitate getting people involved in the process if you want to um, uh, go from a lower investment uh, to higher investment action. We try to make that easy for, for folks. Um, uh, as uh, we mentioned earlier, we have a legislative portal. We also have the legislative news bulletin uh, that goes out weekly and we have action alerts. Our communications team does a great, uh, great job of putting these resources together. So um, definitely take advantage of that during session. We also have a bill tracker. Um, so we work pretty hard to keep uh, people informed uh, on of what's happening during session. Um, I will also mention that most of our private foundation funding uh, does not support advocacy or, or government relations work, lobbying work. Um, so all of this work that we do during session is um, supported by private, don private individual donations. So um, this is something that uh, if you don't have a lot of time or resources, but you want to support the work, um, uh, funding, uh, helping us fund this work so we can do it day in and day out is um uh, very impactful and and very much appreciated. Uh, and then, you know, attending trainings, events, action alerts, um, and we'll talk more about that uh, in a little bit. We also have launched uh, working with our coalition um, uh, to uh, do a public facing campaign in support of IWIL, uh, the Natural Resources uh, and Outdoor Recreation Trust Fund called Fund the Trust. Uh, you can visit our website and we'll have more information coming about that, um, uh, rolling out, you know, at this month and, and um, going forward. So go ahead and follow along there, follow us for more updates and we'll have more um, uh, opportunities to take action there. And then I will toss it back to um, Carrie. All right, so I just wanted to flag a few upcoming uh, things and opportunities to get involved here um, with some of our work on the energy side. Um, hopefully many of you um, saw uh, our recent um, press release and study um, that showed um, really the cost of what customers are paying um, to continue uh, running coal in Iowa. Um, $1.2 billion could be saved if MidAmerican was to retire its coal plants. Um, and we are encouraging folks to um, get involved um, by submitting a comment to the Utilities Board in that docket and asking them to uh, make that a contested case proceeding to um, get more folks' voices in. Um, and then we have a number of webinars that are coming up as well. Um, the first one is really focused for um, mainly county officials. Um, and we are presenting an update of our solar siting ordinance guide um, and our, our best practice guide for siting solar um, on the 12th. On the 20th, we have our uh, webinar on energy um, franchise agreements and municipalization, um, what cities need to know as they are coming up on renewals of their franchise agreements with the utilities. Um, and then on the 9th, um, we have a wind siting webinar, again, focused more towards county officials um, that talks about how ordinances um, can be structured to balance interests involved. Um, and then uh, just today we had posted 
um, the coal plant community study that we released earlier this spring that Iowa State University did for us that looks at the economic impact of coal plants in the communities where they're located, sort of try to give us an idea of what, what kind of impacts communities need to be planning for. Um, that is now available on demand on our YouTube uh, page as well. And so you can see the link there. All of these um, events are available for registration um, at that link below. Thanks, Carrie and Ingrid. Um, and thanks to those of you who are already putting comments in the uh, chat. You can also add questions in the Q&A feature. We're going to get to those here in just a minute. Um, you know, part of what is exciting to see and what we what we just heard from Ingrid and, and Carrie is, you know, all the work that we're doing, both in terms of, you know, research and, um, you know, gathering information about these issues the education and outreach that we're doing, as you see here, both with city and county officials, with state elected officials, with people in state agencies like DNR. Um, so lots of that grass tops work, as well as grassroots organizing and trainings with people like you around the state, um, and really focused on, um, on how we approach these issues through the lens of, of justice and fairness, both for those who are most impacted um, as well as people like um, the workers in our coal plants and things like that. I'm gonna, for some reason, this just started over and I'm gonna zip through slides here if I can. Um, but I wanted to wrap up by just reminding people um, of our legislative portal that we've talked about repeatedly. Um, go check that out on our website. Lots of great resources there that will help you stay on top of what's happening with the 2022 session, as well as um, you know ways you can get involved. Um, I also wanted to just uh, reiterate what what Ingrid was just sharing that our legislative and advocacy work really depends on you, um, both your involvement as as concerned citizens but also your support um, as, as financial contributors. So we are really grateful for um, so, so many people who stepped up and supported our work in 2021. And we depend on that um, this year as well. And so we'll mention a couple of things coming up about events and ways that you can support our work. But I wanted to, to now turn to some of our, um, our questions in that are coming in. Um, so again, go ahead and type in the Q&A feature there, um, as well as in the chat if, if you want to do that. Um, maybe we'll start, Ingrid, do you want to say a little bit about, about I Will? You mentioned this briefly, um, things that we're anticipating, what some of the opportunities might be this year around um, a sales tax that would help to support conservation and outdoor recreation. Sure, yeah, I'm happy to talk about that, our, our efforts there a little bit more. Um, first, we have uh, the, the last thing I mentioned was uh, a public facing campaign. This is partially to remind people what I will is, or you know, it's been over a decade now. Um, so there are some people who voted for it, maybe, maybe didn't realize it hadn't been, it hasn't been funded yet. Um, there, or there are people who have moved or, you know, grown up in this period of time. Uh, we had an intern who um, uh, said she was like in elementary school when uh, it passed. So again, I think there, there's the, the opportunity is ripe for um, kind of reinvigorating the, that grassroots support for Iowa. And that's um, independent of any specific legislative vehicle. Uh, and that's with our larger um, Fund the Trust Coalition. Um, uh, from IAC's perspective on the legislative side, we are watching to see what happens with the overall um, tax policy coming out of the legislature. We've heard uh, a number of things. One of the, one of the questions came up of if income tax is, is material, materially lowered or eliminated, um, wouldn't that necessitate a sales tax increase? Um, I think that's one potential eventuality. So we're looking at, again, how that would uh, affect I will. 
Uh, but right now we're just hearing a lot of different things. So uh, again, this goes back to our, you know, having a presence at the Capitol and making sure we can monitor and be responsive to things and also um, sort of planning with our coalition, you know, these are complex issues. So what are our floors and ceilings of uh, things that, um, you know, we want to see out of this uh, kind of legislation and what are our um, levers to pull as far as negotiation and um, influencing what that legislation looks like. Yeah, so we know taxes are going to be part of the agenda of this session, and we're really closely monitoring that. And there's an opportunity, but but also, you know, a lot of, of unknowns about that. I want to give Carrie a chance to address some of the comments we've got coming in about renewable energy, um, especially things like wind and solar, how those might impact um, agricultural lands, um, how that might be both an opportunity, but how there's also some some considerations there. So as we just mentioned, we have some upcoming events specifically for county officials to think about the right kind of county policies about this. But Carrie, do you wanna address some of those questions and how that might relate to this legislative session? Yeah, absolutely. And I was I was really happy to see the robust discussion in the chat. I really appreciate people um, people jumping in and having that conversation because it is a really important one to have. And it's an area where there's both a lot of concern and innovation happening. And I think we saw that even develop in the course of the comments. Um, you know, there are, if you look at the state as a whole and how much solar we would need to contribute to a 100% renewable electrical system, it would be about 1% of the land in Iowa, which is a very small um, amount. However, we know that with these larger facilities, you're going to have them concentrated in certain areas. Um, and so, you know, the, the folks in those areas are going to, um, they're going to, you know, what they see and, and how things look and everything is going to change for them. But when you look at the overall impact on agriculture generally in the state and agricultural land, it's not going to change um, Iowa's ability to produce. I think someone mentioned that you know, we've got what 50 or 60% of our land right now, the corn that's being grown is, is going into ethanol. Um, an energy source. And so we're talking about taking 1% of the land and diverting it to um, another energy source, renewable energy production, which has a bunch of other uh, co-benefits for the environment, including water quality benefits, um, allowing the land to rest and regenerate. Um, in particular, we're looking at um, beneficial co-uses agriculturally, whether it's grazing, pollinator habitat, um, you know, researchers are working on a lot of different options. Um, and of course, we want to see locations with minimal impact. So using marginal land, um, doing small scale solar um, on, on buildings and, and otherwise unusable land, like we are definitely supportive of all of that. But we know that to address climate change in a timely manner, we have to keep a lot of options on the table. Um, and you know, right now, the way that development is happening, it's voluntary. There's no eminent domain being used. Um, you know, landowners are voluntarily entering into these agreements. So we just we just want to see um, we don't want to see that um, artificially uh, restricted in a way that's not balanced. Um, I would also say I would add to that, Carrie, that this this also ties into our water and land um, priority around investing in a multi beneficial, you know, multi use landscape. So again, kind of breaking out of that paradigm of you know the highest best use of Iowa land is intensive row crop agriculture and thinking more holistically about how to use our resources in the in the most sustainable um, and resilient way possible. Yeah, so that actually leads into one of the other questions we had, which is about, um, you know, how does IEC think about agriculture as a contributor to climate change, but then also as, you know, part of the solution to climate change? Um, Ingrid, do you want to, you know, kind of build on what you were just saying and talk about, you know, how, um, how we're thinking about this, you know, Iowa being a leader in clean energy and how agriculture can also be part of that um, climate leadership? 
Yeah, absolutely. And and I would say um, this is something that we are working, you, you know, uh, but, you know, across programs, you know, with the entire organization. Uh, again, when you look at Iowa's contributions to climate change, uh, it's going to be primarily in that agricultural sector. So there's a lot of uh, opportunity there for um, agriculture to be a leader. Um, there's obviously also a decent amount of, of resistance um, to, you, you know, change uh, that would make Iowa more climate resilient. So I think we're looking at, um, we're trying to look at climate change and, and policy through the lens of, you know, again, what's, what's multi-beneficial, but also, you know, what what are you gonna, what is the biggest bang for our buck? So um, like Carrie said, we're, we're on a short timeline for addressing climate change. So we, we need to make big strides quickly. And um, you know, how do we invest in the appropriate technologies at this point and low hanging fruit to achieve uh, greenhouse gas reductions now and yesterday. And Carrie, I, I know we've seen, um, not surprisingly, we've seen some questions come in about the carbon pipeline. And this is something that, um, yeah, we've been monitoring really closely for several months now. Um, do you want to say just a little bit about, you know, how how we're responding to that? Yeah, um, so we, you know, we're obviously everyone in Iowa is aware of uh, the two carbon sequestration pipelines that are being proposed. Um, and, you know, if we look at the IPCC um, recommendations on what we need to do to address climate change and stick to the more aggressive 1.5 degrees Celsius target, we know that carbon sequestration is absolutely a part of that um, picture. Um, if I had my choice in how I was going to deploy capital and resources right now, I would put them into transformation of the electrical grid, investments in agricultural changes, um, reducing um, emissions in an absolute manner versus trying to sequester emissions underground. Um, and so, you know, for that reason, I think that there are some, you know, some questions about the timing of investments, et cetera. Um, there is the federal tax credit that's available right now that I think is a major driver behind the CO2 pipeline. Um, we definitely would not be supportive of any attempts to um, use a CO2 sequestration project um, that would go to something like enhanced oil recovery or would you know, keep a fossil fuel plant operating longer. That's absolutely not something that we support. Um, and we're also um, continuing to gather input from people who are impacted by the CO2 pipeline. Um, and, and the thoughts and concerns that people have. So we appreciate um, people bringing their concerns and, um, and learning, you know, we're still learning more about it. We know that there are other groups um, that are really actively organizing on this, including um, the Sierra Club here in Iowa. And so, um, you know, right now we're, we're kind of in a continuing to learn and watch mode on this. Um, so that, that's kind of where IEC is at. Yeah, thanks, Carrie. So I just want to wrap up by um, reminding everybody of some upcoming events and opportunities. Um, so again, the session starts next week. You can watch the governor's condition of the state speech um, on Tuesday night. Um, a couple of questions came in the chat. So we will have a virtual advocacy day where we'll do some training on February 16th. So if you're looking to and learn more about how you can write an effective letter or op-ed, how you can um, be most impactful through, you know, reaching out, setting up conversations with elected officials. We're going to do some of that, um, make it really accessible to people around the state on February 16th. And then our in-person advocacy day at the Capitol will be on March the 2nd. So, we will again have you know, lots of our partner organizations, member organizations together in the rotunda. And our hope really is that people can do some training and preparation in February, can schedule some conversations with their elected officials so that when you come in person on March 2nd or even you know, virtually that you can set up 
um, and schedule conversations where you can talk about the kind of issues that you care about and we can help provide you with you know, inf information and resources um, to help inform that conversation and, and help you um, make the biggest impact you can through those conversations on March the 2nd. And then as we did last year, we're gonna have a fun uh, fundraising event that same day, that evening, we'll have environmental mixology. So um, music, drink, and opportunity for you to gather with other people, both in person and virtually people who care about these issues, a chance to connect with each other and to support our work financially um, as we build community together. So again, we really depend on your support. Um, we encourage you to check out our legislative portal throughout the session, and we'll keep you posted on things where you can step up and, and be helpful and influential. Um, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, thanks for being engaged with these issues. Um, as we saw in the chat, there's so many ways that these issues connect um, that we try to work really collaboratively to bring together unlikely partners you know, um, we saw a mention about our work with hog producers on solar and the way that we're trying to think about how climate change and environmental justice connect across all these different issues of clean water and air and water um, and energy in the state. And so we really appreciate all of you helping us to see those connections and pay attention to how you're impacted, how the most vulnerable around us are impacted and how together we can build a strong uh, coalition to respond to these issues. So um, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, there's our contact information. We look forward to talking with you throughout the legislative session and beyond as we work to uh, support good environmental policy in Iowa. So thanks for being here um, and for supporting 